The bandwidth for this episode of the AR-15 Podcast is sponsored by the Firearms Radio Network. Firearmsradio.tv Director of Commercial Sales. Is that the title that you have uh, you carry with you these days? That that is. And actually, uh, one thing that we've done this year is changed our name and or updated it to just be FN rather than the uh, FNH USA. So no. glo- globally, we looked at who we are, what we do, and around the world, we are FN. Go on record to say you need to tell your your. Your PR guy is to get on LinkedIn and update everybody. <laughs> your entire company, you're all FNH USA. I, I will take the blame for that. I have not updated LinkedIn. <laughs> oh, no, I'm talking about everybody that is related to FN is FNH USA. Of you guys I'm going to have to find what my password is to update LinkedIn. <laughs> <laughs> well, so um, we have an NRA show coming up, and... Uh, Jake wanted us to remind the listeners that if they're going to be out there at Cardinal Hall of Fame Cafe on Saturday, May 21st at 7 p.m., there is going to be a listener meetup. And uh, Jake says that if you can say the word ambidextrous as well as he can, he'll buy you a drink. And so um, just for the record, it's uh, ambidextrous. That's, That's the way that he pronounces it. Um, if you put extra syllables or continent, uh, consonants in there, then I think you'll be doing far better. Um, so give it a shot and uh, see if you can't get a couple rounds out of the old guy. Amphibious? Hey, uh, I, I like that. I like that. <laughs> My AR is amphibious. Um, well, Mark, why don't you tell us what you've been uh, up to in, uh, in the firearms world these last couple of uh, weeks? What's been keeping you busy? Uh, well, I mean, uh, this year started off to be a, a great year. I mean, uh, if anyone's watched uh, the news, um, there there may be some happenings going on, on on CNN and MSNBC and Fox News, if you're so inclined. That uh, it has caused folks to uh, go ahead and go out there and and maybe think about uh, purchasing a firearm. So. Uh, on on this side of the firearms fence, it's it's more about making sure we get the right stuff uh, produced and and out into stores so that people can can take them on home. So that's what has kept us very busy for the last couple of months. Well, you know, I got to tell you that by comparison, mine is very mundane. I I actually had an opportunity to get on a, a was it a Granger Supply? Yeah, uh, actually makes uh, the right tap screws and uh, washers, uh, spacers, for uh, use in all of my uh, arrow lowers. And uh, I use those spacers that are exactly point uh, oh three o inches uh, thick, uh, just like the, uh, um, I guess it's the cup on the uh, barrel right behind the gas block on most uh, ARs. Uh, so that it kind of fits between the shoulder and my gas block, and it's just a little disc. It's the right diameter for my uh, uh, barrel, the point uh, 0.750, and so I just thought I'd experiment with uh, what Granger has to offer. And now I feel just very mundane compared to someone who's shaping the firearms world, you know. So, well, JD, I guess you can follow up uh, my very mundane last week with. What exciting thing you're doing in Vegas? Um, well, I skipped um, shooting with some friends to take five kids to the Monster Jam World Finals to see Monster Truck. So I think I won dad points. Uh, I missed strange time, but uh, eh, they'll always be next weekend. So <laughs> yeah, the range will always be there. The Monster Jam, that, that's in and out, right? Yeah, that's in and out. <laughs> well, so, uh, Mark, I know we have you on here from FN, and uh, you guys make a a damn fine rifle, but uh, we're giving away a, a new Frontier rifle, and, and I hope you'll pardon us for a minute while we uh, 
collaborate with the competition for a second. Uh, absolutely. JD, why don't you go ahead and tell the guys about uh, this pending uh, giveaway uh, so that we can kind of keep the excitement and the buzz going. Absolutely. Uh, David, the owner of uh, New Frontier Armory, has graciously um, given a rifle to give away for the AR-15 podcast. It will be one of their uh, 9mm rifle carbines, and uh, it's going to have their Glock upper and lower that takes Glock magazines. Uh, also has that bolt hold open. Um, I got to see some of the stuff that they have in the store last week. It is going to be a phenomenal rifle. Uh, another company has stepped up and said that uh, they're going to join and uh, do some uh, work on the rifle also. So it's going to be really cool once it all gets together. Just sent um, David the schematics for the AR-15 podcast logo the other day, so uh, they are going to go ahead and put that on there for us. Uh, it's really exciting to be able to give you guys uh, a rifle to this first half of the year. Uh, we're going to start the giveaway. We're going to start the sign-ups April 1st. Uh, there'll be no jokes or no fools or anything like that. We will have it uh, linked to the AR15podcast.com page and also Facebook and always in the show notes. So we will uh, start the giveaway on that coming up April 1st and uh, run it for about six to eight weeks uh, to give everybody a shot to get in. And it's just going to be a random drawing. And, Reed, we've done our best to uh, make it California compliant. Um, we're also willing to work with somebody from the great state of New York if they happen to, to be the winner of uh, this 9mm carbine from New Frontier Armory. Check them out if you if you would. Stop by their Facebook page, send them an email, say thank you for supporting the AR-15 podcast. Well, with that, Mark, yes. are you ready to talk about some of your military collector's items that are in the new lineup this year? Absolutely. I mean, we are, are, are very excited <clears throat> with our, you know, name change from FNH USA to FN. You know, what we're really trying to do is let people know who we are and what we do. I mean, we produce, you know, firearms for not only our military, but militaries around the world for, you know, 125 years. We are the most battle-proven firearms. And to really drive that home and to, to let folks know here in the U.S., um, you know who we are and, and what we do. We are releasing, or actually, we released our M4 and M16 military collector series rifles. And what these are are the most authentic clones that you can have of a military M4 or a military M16. And I mean, it has been a, a painstaking process. It's taken. You'd think it'd be very easy to do, but. Um, it's not, <laughs> and we we have made uh, you know great efforts and and painstaking details to to make sure that everything is done so it looks exactly the same as our military uh, rifles. The the end result is you know the goal that we we started with is to have an M4 off of our military line and an M4 out of our commercial line and lay them both on the table and not be able to tell the difference between the two until you picked it up and function checked it. And I think we did a, a damn fine job doing it. Now, now tell me, did you go to the uh, length of, I don't know, putting a faux nub where you would have found that... Uh, pin above your safety selector where you're typically going to look to see uh, the difference between a semi and a military uh, rifle? Um, or, or did you not go to that length of uh, faux, <laughs> faux forgery? Well, I mean, we, we uh, I'll tell you this. We went through and the, the, all the lowers are marked, um, safe, semi, and auto. Um, when you get down to putting a, you know, where the auto sear pin is, putting a faux nub there, uh, as you call it, you actually do run into a kind of a, uh, well, you just marked the hole. Mm, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that we didn't figure was worth the, uh, the, the, the potential issues. So we yes, went, we went ahead and, and went with the safe semi and auto engraving on it. Um, but, but they do, they are marked like that. The rifles do come with a card that you can keep with the rifle in your range bag, what, what have you, to, 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 to let somebody know this is a semi-automatic rifle. 
<laughs> this is not a machine gun. Don't don't ask me for my paperwork. So, in terms of this process, was it a pretty lengthy process to kind of say, "All right, you know, here is what we make for the commercial sector, and we want to make something that copies our military contract." Is, is it? A tough thing to get that across to guys that are used to appealing to the dictates of a commercial market, or was that a pretty easy process? Um, you know, it, it was a lengthy process um, for for a couple of reasons. The you know the engineers and the product team that that's back in Columbia, you know, they're really dedicated on uh, you know. They're perfectionists, so there's a lot of things that um, you know they, they work really hard to make not only as as functional on these firearms, but you know to look as good as they possibly can. So there were you know great steps that they went through for our commercial receivers and so forth to make them the least amount of flaws and nicks and dents and dings and special you know processes to to get them from you know birth to coating to in a box and out the door as pristine as possible. On the flip side, the military gun, you know, it comes with dents and dings and scratches already in it, straight from the factory. That's, you know, that, that's how good old Uncle Sam gets it. Um, just because it, it's, that's the, you know, the way that gun is made. Um, if you look at a military receiver, the parting line at the front of the magazine well, it's still there. It's not buffed and polished out. And the same thing at the rear of the receiver. On a commercial gun, you don't see that because there's extra steps taken to, to, to remove those to make it pretty. Well, it doesn't do us any good to write M4 on the side of it and, and have it being this pretty gun to where that's not what, you know, you carried. Um, or, you know, what's issued and so forth. So it, it was, you know, a, a long process to have a sit there with people that are used to trying to make it look as good as possible. Like, no, 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 I, w I want the dents. I want the nicks. I want the scratches. I want the dings. But we polished that out. I, I don't want that to happen. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, we, we had to do that. And you have to balance it with, um, you know, in the factory, the military line is the military line. And, and, and we can't mess with that. It would be nice if we could just be like, hey, crank a few of these out over here and we'll just sell them on this side. But it is completely, you know, it's a completely separate operation. And, you know, those those guys um, and, and that part of the business is set up for the government and we can't mess with that. So it did take us quite a while to go through and make sure that we were doing it all right on the commercial side to make an M4 and an M16 as absolutely authentic of a clone as possible and you know I, I, like I said I, I think we did a pretty dang good job you know all the way from the the right number of dents dings and scratches to the parting lines the UID labels with the cage codes and and the you know uh, real Knights rifles or I mean Knights uh, Knights rails on the guns and so forth they're they are spot on they're really spot on now, did that mean that you guys would have to take field trips over to the government side and and have your your guys take copious notes and and just kind of try to sort out the, the the steps back they had to take, you know, from modern commercial manufacturing, or or was it just a whole bunch of kind of trial and error? No, I mean it, it's 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 no secret. I mean it's just but if you have a military gun sitting there, you just want to make sure that you know when we when we do the upper receiver, um, you know now on all the commercial guns, you just white laser engrave the the numbers on there. Well, the right. military ones are engraved and then painted. So it, it's a more expensive process for us to paint them. They're like, well, we can just laser them. I'm like, no, no, no. <laughs> you, you gotta, you know, you, you gotta engrave it and then and then paint the numbers in there. I'm like, okay. So, you know, it wasn't like they had to sit over there and take notes or, or, or re-engineer the wheel. Um, just had to make sure that, you know, if there was ever a question of, you know, should we go left or go right on this, you know, just look at the, the, the military gun and, and you know what it is and okay well we want to make it look more like that one. Well you know for, for a moment there I had this vision in my head of the uh, Chinese airsoft companies that send a team of dozens to take a thousand pictures and sketches and take notes and <laughs> I, was, I was just trying to clarify whether or not there was any <laughs> 
So um, <laughs> you mentioned the uh, the Knights Armament uh, rails. Are those um, something that, that you have a license for? Do you buy them from Knights? Is there a, a relationship that extends into the commercial side um, for the development of the, the M4 and the M16 military collectors? Um, I mean, the, those rails, the M4 RAS, is something that uh, Knights Armament offers on the commercial market. So, like I said, the, these guns have to be separate from the military side. So right. we go ahead and purchase, you know, a, a Knights M4 rail um, right from Knights Armament to, to install on the commercial one. So it's uh, – they're, they're legitimate – you know, parts and and the the rifles aren't inexpensive. You know, right. for the guys that used to paying under a thousand dollars for an M4, you know, these guns are uh, you know fifteen ninety nine. Um, I have the MSRP in front of me here in a second. They're seventeen forty nine is the MSRP on the gun, and uh, you know, there's things like that night's rail. That is not an inexpensive rail, mm -hmm. and the the uh, the, the proper rear sight on it and, and all the things that go into it. and uh, This is not an inexpensive venture, but it is exceptionally authentic. Well, you know, I have a nice rail for a rifle that I currently have uh, uh, in my safe, and I, it, it, it is, A, very hard to get one, and, B, uh, I, I will absolutely support you whenever you say they are expensive. Yeah. There is nothing <laughs> cheap about that rail. Um, but you know, I think it's a fabulous rail. I think it's really, really nice, and you know, it. it I think it, it's a nice commitment that you're going to go in there and you're just going to make it right. So I, I, I think I, I, I like the fact that that's the direction that that FN takes, because I think well, some you. people would, you know, put the, you know, the two part handguard in there and just call it a day. Yeah, it, you know, it was something when, when we really looked at this, not only the folks that, um, you know, want to purchase a, a, an M4 or an M16, but the, you know, the, the greater duty we felt to the former service members, um, you know, folks that are veterans that, you know, want to have the rifle that they, you know, were issued or that they carried and so forth. I can't tell you how many folks that uh, we debuted them, we showed them a sneak preview at NRA last year um, and, and at SHOT Show and so forth, and, and we get lots of feedback and so forth of, of guys that served. And this is their opportunity to to purchase the gun that they had. You know, obviously it's not full auto, but everything else about it is the same. So they can have it and it's real. So that attention to detail and the level of authenticity is something that we took very seriously. If it was a 95% gun, you know, there was no, I, I said there was no reason for us to do it. You know, it had to be spot on. Right. Um, and and, and, I, and I will give up on the M4 carbine. There is two tenths of an inch on the barrel that we had to add <laughs> 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 to to make it legal. But you know you you can't tell. Now I noticed in the description that it said on the uh, M4 that the um, muzzle device was permanently attached. Is is that correct? Yes. And is yes, that the, the, kind of an ATF ruling on the issue of barrel length? And... Correct. Um, I mean, as you know, it's got to be a 16-inch barrel. Um, mm. So the military M4 barrel is 14.5 inches, and mm. with the, the standard A2 flash hider, uh, even permanently attaching that, so once you permanently attach, it counts as barrel length. Mm. Um, so if you just put a A2 onto the standard barrel, it doesn't quite meet the 16-inch length. Those so what other – what's that? It was those two tents. Yeah, those two tents. So what other folks had done in the past to, to do things like that, they would take a 14-and-a-half-inch barrel, and they went the, the easy route and just made an A2 compensator that was just a little bit longer and pinned it on there because the barrel was cheap. They could get them, you know, the right barrel cheaper. But when you look at it, you can tell it doesn't look right. The compensator's longer. I mean, when something's only an inch and now you increase it by, you know, 20%, you're like, hey, that doesn't look right. But when we take a 14.5-inch barrel and make it 14.7 inches and pin the right flash height or compensator on there, you can't tell. You know, it's mm -hmm. one of those things you can't call. You're like, hey, that looks funny. 
So, I mean, those are, like I said, the, the attention to detail that we had of, because, I mean, I'm a gun guy and, and we're gun guys. Like, here's how I'd want it. Now, it's not to say we won't have, you know, SBR models in the future that if you want a 14.5 inch barrel and you want the compensator to be removable, you know, I'd, uh, I'd keep watching this space to, to see when your opportunity is to buy a, an SBR from us. <laughs> Well, so in terms of kind of the driver for this, was this, I don't know, trying to pay homage to the, the guys that have been carrying and working with these rifles since you began manufacturing them? Was there something internal, some, some internal pride in doing this? Tell me, what's the genesis of making the decision to kind of proceed on this line? Um, I mean, all the things that you said right there are, are, you know, really rolled into it. It's something that looking at our heritage and looking at what we do, we have a history of taking our military firearms, our military machine guns, and making them available to the commercial market. Um, you see that in the in the PS90 came from the P90 machine gun, and the FS2000 came from the F2000 machine gun. The SCAR, um, you know, 16 and 17 came from the 5.56 and 7.62 machine guns that we, we make for the government. So we've got a long history of taking those machine guns, making them semi-auto, and, and you know making them available. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so we wanted to continue down that path and really embrace you know the the what we're doing right now. You know now that we have have come into the the AR-15 market, you know a lot of people don't know and who FN is or, or what FN does in, in regard to M4s, M16s, AR-15s, and so forth. So we, we had some commercial models, and we got a lot of people going, well, well why is FN making an AR? And we're like, yeah. um, hmm, we need a good way to tell this story. So, you know, we're really doing that across the board as a company with, with our, our whole push this year, and not only this year, but into the future of solidifying and clarifying our company as FN and really driving home that, that you know, we are the world's most battle-proven firearms and now kind of addressing the largest segment of the most popular firearm, you know, in, in, in the world today, um, rather than just having, you know, the P90s and FS. 2000s and scars and so forth. Here's M4s, ladies and gentlemen, and here are M16s. This is who we are. This is what we do. And now you can have this from us. And, and it really drives home to the American, you know, public and to the consumers. This is why we're making AR-15s. Now I'm gonna I'm gonna reach here um, because I'm not all that familiar with all the different variants. But when it comes to the broad spectrum of the armed services that have used uh, the M16 or the M4 or the other kind of derivations on the, the platform, the stoner platform, how many more of those are FN rifles? I mean, I know Daniel Defense makes one. Um, of course, there's a lot of stuff that gets modified. So is there something more that you guys can lay claim to that's kind of still out there unrepresented in the military collector series? Um, I may have got a little, little well, sideways like on the, your question there. <laughs> we have the Mark 18, the Mark 12. Uh, um, you know, they've, they've kind of gone into the 308 side of these things. We've got a whole host of variants on the platform in military use. But, of course, you know, the question I have, because I, I predate FN's presence in this U.S. military space mm -hmm. for this rifle. I mean, of course, I got to shoot a saw when I was in the Marine Corps, and those things were just awesome. But in, in that space, are there more variants that you guys lay claim to as far as the bones, the genetics of that rifle? Well, um for the vast majority of it, the you know the standard issue firearms being the M4 and the M16, that's the, the 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 giant bulk of them. Now there are iterations and variations that smaller groups and units and places and things you know buy. Um, I'm not on the government side, and I don't have my fingers in you know which cool kids are buying what uh, what thing. So I 
I can't honestly speak to any of those uh, different derivatives. Um, I, I will tell you we are, um, you know, definitely looking at other things that we provide and making those available, um, not only in the the AR15 platform, but in the SCAR platform as well. You know, the uh, the the SCAR 20s um, is something that's in service as the Mark 20. So we're jumping through some hoops, and again, you'll see something uh, hopefully in the future down the road on, you know, uh, a collector series of, of that. You know, if it's something that we have, have sold on contract to the government, um, it would be my desire to have those available to you um, in a similar, in a similar, you know, form and fashion. Because, you know, let, let's face it, I, as a shooter, I want one. <laughs> Right, and even though we make them as machine guns and everything else, I can't take those home. So I want one of these. Well, I, <laughs> so I was I always kind one. of. What's I was that? kind of curious about when you guys were going to come out with a uh, uh, a Ma Deuce and the uh, semi-auto. Well, you know, we're I love belt feds. <laughs> um, so the the next iteration, or the uh, you know the, the 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 next logical step from the M4 M16, you know we release the M249 um, in semi-auto. So you know that that really uh, we we showed it last year. You know we said all right Christmas time. So we shipped true to our word. We shipped uh, the first batches of those things right at Christmas, and we've been fulfilling them. Uh, you know this year we'll continue to fulfill more and more of those. And I mean, there is something that is so cool about the M249. You know, the uh, you mentioned earlier, you got to shoot the the saw, the squad automatic weapon. Well, yeah. not not many people have, and it's not <laughs> something you really get to take home. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> well, any, uh, let's let's talk about about the saw. And, mm -hmm. and so. Was there something, was there a eureka moment where someone said, hey, let's take a machine gun that really nobody has any exposure to unless you're in the military and make it available? I mean, yeah. was, I, mean <laughs> you know, I think we're, it's awesome. But. I, and, uh, you know, as we're sitting here going through, you know, the collector series and, and getting back to – you know who we are and what we do. We're like, look, the 249. It, it's, I mean, it's it's portable, it's convenient, it's it's sexy. I mean, damn, it looks good. <laughs> you know, and, and we get people going, well, why why would you want a semi-automatic machine gun? And and I've got folks that uh, you know before we came out with it, they're like, I, I don't know that I want it in semi-auto. It's just a 17-pound AR. And then when <laughs> the and then when you have it, and you go here and you hand it to them, they're like. Okay, I get it. Never mind. Put me down for one. Uh, <laughs> it's just it's there's just something so cool about it. It's just this dominating, amazing thing, and to be able to to take it home and you know put it on your coffee table and then take it out to the range and and shoot this thing. It's just it's awesome. <laughs> well, so let's uh, let's go over some of the the primary. Elements of the 249. So, it is in its civilian uh, semi-auto configuration, capable of being belt-fed and still retains its ability to uh, uh, take on 30-round standard magazines. Right? Yep. Yep. The uh, the magazine ports there. You can put 30-round uh, mags in it. You can put them. Uh, you know, aluminum. Uh, P mags work great. The uh, new uh, PMAG D60, the 60 round one, works like a champ in that bad boy. Um, and then the, uh, but, but, but let's be honest, it takes a 200 round belt. <laughs> 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 you know, you, you clip that, that, that box magazine um, clips right into the, the bottom side of the 249 there, and you link up 200 rounds, and it is awesome. I mean, it is just awesome. And, and if 200 rounds isn't enough for you, you know, you can uh, you can get one of the the uh, backpacks from Tier Tactical, and I believe in five five six it'll hold a thousand uh, thousand rounds belted up a five five six for you. I don't know Dang. if I could hold a thousand rounds. It's not that heavy. <laughs> <laughs> they they made the backpack. It's the uh, the Myco um, 
uh, backpack, I believe, and it's for the Mark 48, the 762, and it holds like 575 rounds of 762. So wow. it feeds out of your back down a, a shoot down your arm right into the side of the gun, That's and crazy. it works just fine for the 249. But since the 556 is smaller, you can get about a thousand rounds on you. <laughs> well, so where can you find belted 223, belted 556? Um, there's a few folks online that sell belted ammo. Um, it, it's, uh, you know, it takes standard M27 links. Um, you know, for a lot of folks, that's not going to be, you know, uh, every day, um, an item that, they, oh yeah, I had a bunch of those sitting in the corner, like the yeah. magazines. It, it does take your magazines, but links are, are relatively inexpensive. And the nice thing about 5.56 is you don't need a linking machine or anything else to, you know, to put it together. Um, you know, I, I've had saws in the past and and bought all sorts of linking machines. And, uh, you know, you come standard equipped with the, the two best linking machines on the planet. And it, it's it's really easy to do. And, uh, you know, some of you can sit there and watch TV and link up a couple thousand rounds and be ready to go. You know, I, I like putting a, putting my uh, 556 on strippers. So stripper clips, not the uh, <laughs> strippers. <laughs> but, uh, I'm like, how many of those constitute a dollar? <laughs> <laughs> so, so yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll sit in front of the the TV and and you know, ten at a time, you know, fill uh, clips and uh, throw them back in the can because I think it's a whole lot easier to just zip those into your you know magazine with a spoon than it is to feed ten at a time, but. No. Yeah, no, they they, they yeah. work great. So yeah, you just uh, you know, it's just as easy to put them on uh, put them in links. All right. Well, so uh, you can find already linked belted ammo at some online distributors, but can you buy those links in big giant packs pretty easily? Yes. Um, I'm sure they're going to get harder and harder to get, but uh, you know, it's one of those things that the the, the military orders and you know. I would guess billions of rounds uh, linked, and, and those, uh, you know, for for the folks that are buying linked ammo, um, it's usually a disposable item. So there's an enterprising folks that pick them up and make them available to folks that uh, would like to purchase them. So it, they're they're not a very expensive item. <laughs> well, so in terms of uh, what the 249 uh, retails with, I'm assuming it doesn't come with a magazine, does it? It does. It, does it, it does come with a magazine. <laughs> I'd almost rather have you know the links rather than a magazine. It comes with those as well. <laughs> it does. Yes. Okay. Well, now I'm told I have to get one. <laughs> no, I mean we 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 couldn't uh, we couldn't have you pick up your shiny new M249s from the store and be like, but I don't have any links. <laughs> so uh, each, each of them will come with a, a 200 round box magazine uh, with 200 links in it, um, and then a 30 round magazine as well. So you can yeah. shoot it right away, um, <laughs> and then it's up to you to to go grab some more links. I'm I'm. Totally enamored with that fin right now. <laughs> yeah, everybody thought that I was a, a Colt fanboy or a Mega Arms fanboy. No, I am a full-blooded FN fanboy <laughs> right now. I want to see the purse you buy your wife to uh, to equal out this deal there, Reed. Yeah, no, that, that's not going to happen. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't know that they even make that purse. I, I don't know if... if, if I've ever mentioned it while you were with us, uh, Mark, but my wife had, and I have an agreement. For every firearm I purchase, I buy her a purse. Ah. So understand that my wife encourages my love of SIGs because it puts <laughs> her in a purse price range that she enjoys. Nice. Um, <laughs> if I was buying, you know, $200 Tauruses, my wife would be very irritated with me. <laughs> this is the duct tape purse. <laughs> <laughs> All right, yes, so there, there, that would be uh, that would be an expensive trip to a. Uh, oh, I don't even know the high end purse lines. <laughs> that would I be... don't know that that high end purse line would let me through the door to buy one. <laughs> <laughs> you look like an individual with a firearm. <laughs> <laughs> 
So, so tell me, um, in terms of uh, some of the other components, uh, the changeable barrel, do you sell a spare barrel? Is it not necessary based on what you anticipate the civilian usage of a barrel is? We will, um, you know, right out the gate, the, the guns are coming in a military case. Uh, the, when I say case, it, it's the, the beefy cardboard box that it comes with um, is the standard gun. The first 200 were a limited edition. We put them in a, in a giant plastic hard case, a lockable hard case, and it came more like we deliver a firearm as far as the, the saw. And it, had, it comes with a spare barrel um, tool kit and, and a whole bunch of other stuff in there that uh, you know, made it really cool to be part of the first 200. I think the reality of semi-automatic fire out of a, uh, a gun that was designed to be you know, ab abused on full auto, that barrel is going to last you a long time. Mm -hmm. um, we will also have spare barrels available for sale, but uh, I mean right now we're, the response has been tremendous. Um, the production of those we've asked the factory several times now to increase it. Um, I, I don't think they want to take my phone call anymore. Um, <laughs> Because every time I call, I just ask for more. Um, so it, it will be a little bit till, till barrels um, are available by themselves. But yes, barrels will be available. And, uh, you know, it, it it takes all the standard M249 stuff. You know, the, the, the barrels change out the same way. They're the same barrel. Um, you know, on, on this one, we didn't build, yeah, uh, you know, a... Um, a cheap barrel for it or cheap parts anywhere else. I mean, it's a standard top cover. It's a standard buttstock. It's got the hydraulic buffer. It's got the, you know, the same super hard steel chrome line barrel. I mean, everything, it's the same gas regulators. All this stuff is the same. I mean, it is, uh, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a built for, built for war firearm no. that we modify and, and you know, put in semi-auto. The, the, the moving parts group is different. Um, you know, there's extra stuff in there to make it fire from a closed bolt rather than be an open bolt machine gun. So in terms of the, the, the 249 itself, uh, is that a platform where any exist in a pre-86 transferable format? Is that something that is marketed or traded on? That you're aware of? I'm not really. Yes, there, there's sure. there's a handful of them that mm -hmm. are pre-86 transferables. Um, haven't seen one in a while. I think the last one, uh, what I saw, was around a quarter million. Um, <laughs> so there there's 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 post-May dealer samples of them that are out there. Um, well, they're probably a lot more reasonable, aren't they? Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, I'm sorry, not a post made, but I mean, right now there's just uh, you know restricted dealer samples. Right. Uh, yeah, they're they're more reasonable, but they're uh, you know they're they're comparable they're to the militaries and <laughs> I don't know any police departments that buy machine guns like that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you'd be surprised. <laughs> <laughs> well, so uh, you know, I think the big question I'd have is how long until slide fire gets a stock for one of the saws? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm I'm sure with something as cool as this, um, a couple accessory folks will be um, working away to offer their their wares, and and that'll be cool. Well, if we if we see you making the transition over to slide fire, we'll know what happened. <laughs> yeah, I tell you, I've I've uh, spent a good amount of trigger time behind it, um, and it has got a super sweet trigger, um, which is really kind of odd to odd to say for my closed bolt, you know, <laughs> belt fed gun. <laughs> It has got a fantastic trigger on there. Um, it, it feels like a super slick uh, double action revolver because there's not a lot of weight to it, but you have you have to have some movement on there, and uh, you can you can shoot that gun fast. Wow! Um, you can really shoot it fast. I, I just saw a video with uh, Jerry Mikulik online um, on YouTube with uh, one of the semi-auto guns, and he's I mean he's ripping rounds offhand across targets, and I mean he's he's just hammering on that thing. You can you can shoot it fast. Now, in terms of, of taking it to the range, having it out there and just enjoying it, um, 
what what's that experience like? I mean, that really is kind of a category all its own. You are the coolest kid at the range, guaranteed. <laughs> I mean, there it is. <laughs> I mean, the guy next to you that brought out the guy next to you that brought out twenty different ARs. Um, you win. <laughs> <laughs> you can bring one case out, set the rifle down, and you win. <laughs> it definitely yeah. causes a crowd. Did you get a lot of rubberneckers? A lot of guys coming to, to kind of talk to you about it, and, and they, they don't even you. bother rubbernecking. They just come <laughs> over and say, "What in the heck?" <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it, um, it definitely, uh, it, it definitely gets attention. Now, I, I want to clarify just for the record that when uh, when I was in the Marine Corps, I uh, I was a driver for the uh, uh, commanding officer of the trailing training battalion at a. Uh, School of Infantry. This was while I was uh, uh, awaiting for my discharge. So first sergeant would let me fire off weapons in the U.S. Marine Corps arsenal that I wasn't rated on and probably shouldn't have ever picked up. And this was <laughs> the saw was one of them. But um, I fired this beastie off the hip um, uh, at a range out there uh, uh, on uh, Pendleton. And, and so I couldn't say that I, I did anything proper with the 249. So, um, Mark, can you kind of describe for everybody what it is to, to load it, to cycle it, to aim? I, I don't even remember if it had sights. I was holding it at my hip, and I just hit the, the happy button with a belt in it and just went to town. Yeah, you know, it, it's it's definitely a different animal than your uh, your standard AR-15, um, but a lot of the principles are, are, are the same. Um, understanding that most folks aren't going to have a background in a belt-fed machine gun, and, and truly, even the folks that do have a background in a belt-fed machine gun, the, the semi-auto version of it operates a little differently. Um, you know, because you're not just throwing the belt in, closing the top cover, cocking it back, and, and getting ready to rock and roll. So what we did is, excuse me, our um, our product management team went through and created a quite a robust um, owner's manual. And it's one of those things that we're like, please read the owner's manual. And, and um, you know, lots of pictures, lots of big, big words, <laughs> you know, big print of, of here, here's the, uh, you know, the, the, the quick way to do it, but here's how you go through it. And I understand they put some videos together and so forth to, to get people accustomed to, here's how this gun operates. And, you know, it's not an inexpensive gun. Um, you know, the MSRP on it's $79.99. Um, so we're not expecting you to, you know, Grab it and you know rip, rip the rip the wrapping paper off with reckless abandon. Load it up, you know, as as fast as you can, and 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 try and rip arounds at the range. Um, it's not overly complicated by any means. It's just one of those things that there is a distinct, you know, open the top cover and load the belt, and here's when you charge it, and and so forth, and and when you can put the safety on, and and when you can't. Um, so it it it's not complicated. It's just one of those things that. You know, read the little hang tag that comes with the gun to to to, to do the order in of operations in this manner, and you know you you won't have a problem. Now, what about the uh, siding system on it? I see what looks like a rear sight and a front sight, but like I said, I wasn't paying too much attention to <laughs> it. It's actually got great sights on there. <laughs> you know, it, it, it's uh, anyone who's fired an AR-15 is going to be, you know, at home and comfortable with the sights. Um, but and then it's got a uh, a piece of Picatinny rail on the top cover there. So depending upon the uh, you know the optic that you want, um, you can put it on there. Uh, you you will have to notice though that the top cover does lift up, <laughs> so it's not going to do any good to put a six and a half by twenty scope on it <laughs> that that extends out way above the barrel, and then when you have to tip that forward, the uh, ocular housing or the the uh, objective lens goes crashing into the top of your barrel. So you know you got to pay a little attention to to the length of your optic. You know red dots are going to be fantastic. Um, Shorter optics, ACOGs, and so forth, uh, will, will work very, very well on them. Um, so, so there's a few things to take into account. How how much has evolved with the the 249 from say the the late 80s? 
Um, you know, I I, I haven't played with a late eighties two forty nine. I know the Pegatinny Rail is uh, something that's uh, way after my time. Yes. Yeah, I mean the the that that platform, you know, has continued to evolve. Um, mm-hmm. You know, maybe not things that are, are super noticeable, but uh, you know, our, our our engineers and so forth never kind of. Uh, I, I never see him sitting out back, um, you know, having a coffee and, and, and shooting hoops. And a lot of times they're still working on some of the guns that we made for 20 years, you know, because there's always something that they can do better. Um, so there's a, I, I'm sure there's a, a, a plethora of things that have, uh, <laughs> have updated over the years. I can't speak to, to, to what they are or what's happened along the way. Um, but, you know, the 249 has followed course with, like, the M4. You know, the M16 get, getting shorter and lighter and, and more rails and different stock systems. So there's quite a few different uh, evolutions of the, the 249 platform. Um, you know, we've started here with the standard one, the iconic, you know, 20-inch um, fixed stock uh you know, with the, the, the bipod that folds into the forearm, when you think 249, I mean, that's the one that, uh, you know, all of us pictured. So that's the one that, uh, you know, we went ahead and, and launched the platform with. But like anything else, you know, it will be a family and not an event, a, a single event. So, you know, keep looking for iterations of that firearm and updates and, and evolutions and changes and things to, to come in the future. Now, in terms of the uh, the 240, the 240 wasn't that the uh, 7.62 caliber replacement for the 60? Yes, yeah, it started out with as the uh, FN produced Mag 58, um, adopted by the U.S. government as the as the 240, so it replaced the M60 um, as a coax gun and a uh, general purpose machine gun. Is that something that? perhaps you're thinking of looking into in the future um, in terms of a civilian semi-auto, maybe a, a 240B and even an M60? Um, well, I mean, the, the, the M60 you wouldn't see out of us, <laughs> but the, uh, um, you know, the 240 is, is the natural evolution that a lot of people ask us about. Um, you know, I, 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 Something that uh, you know we can we can take a look at and and see. Uh, you know the 249 is such a nice platform as far as size and portability and ease and right. use and so forth. When you step up to the 240, um, it is a significantly bigger, longer gun. You know it's a 27 pound rifle. Um, it it truly is. You know it's a big machine gun. You know, so it's really at home on a tripod with, uh, you know, with an assistant gunner feeding you belts. Um, so it's one of those things that, you know, we'll take a look at. And, uh, you know, if there's a, a enough call, hey, who knows? Well, I was just hoping that you'd be coming out with one to put on a pencil mount that I weld to the top of my FJ. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and sorry for about the, the M60 uh, faux pas. Nah, no worries. <laughs> that was one that I didn't get a chance to put any trigger time on, but uh, I wasn't aware that you guys didn't make it because you basically make almost everything else in the U.S. military arsenal, don't you? The the vast majority of firearms for the U.S. military, um, you know, small caliber, so 50 cal and, and, and below. I mean, obviously not the Beretta 9mm, <laughs> right. but, uh, you know, the many, many, many other things. Now, do you make a multi-barrel um, firearm that's a military weapon, a, a minigun or a Gatling gun? Uh, no, we do, we do not. Um, yeah, no, we don't, we don't make them miniguns. Those are, uh, those are an interesting um, Enigma, all of their own. <laughs> I love them. Yeah. I think they're amazing. <laughs> I, I keep trying to figure out someone who's going to come out with one. Um, See, so you do make the GAU twenty one in, in what semi-auto? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I would, I would. I, I know. I, I think Wolfie makes the, the Colt Gatling. 
<laughs> it's semi-auto, isn't it? Because it's only one pull of the trigger per barrel. You just have six barrels that go real fast, right? But for for I mean for a Gatling gun, it's manually operated. That that is that's just a rifle. Exactly. The difference comes when you apply an electronic motor to it. <laughs> and, and I think that's an unfair characterization of what the line you've crossed should be. <laughs> I mean, if I turn a hand crank, it's okay, but if I attach a motor to the axis of that hand crank, it's all of a sudden not okay? I, that's unfair. I, I think there's some questions you don't want to ask. <laughs> <laughs> Well, so it sounds like you guys have a couple of things in the future. You're going to kind of play them close to the vest, but we should see that the Military Collector series is not going to end with just three entries. Is that fair to say? I would say that that is a, um, a very fair statement, that the Collector series will not end with three entries. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Well, if we're going to talk about entries into your lineup this year, you have another one that I think is really a very interesting uh, addition, and that's the FN15 competition. So, yes. Uh, <coughs> um, we started shipping our FN15 competition uh, at the very beginning of this year, and what we did was you know, really build a, build a race car. You know, something that there's there's a couple of us that shoot on the uh, FN Pro team, not only in the Three Gun Nation Pro Series for TV, which is quick and dirty, um, you know, super fast, but also you have to be exceptionally accurate. Um, and you, you wouldn't think that'd be the case, you know, shooting inside of a 100-yard bay, but all of a sudden when they stick little 4-inch circles out there and put, you know, 8, 10, or 12 of them, uh, across the back of a bay, and you got to shoot these things, and you know, shoot shoot plates offhand, and shoot those off the ground after running for 30 seconds or so. There's there's some definite accuracy involved. Um, so we we really wanted a race car not only for the the pro series, but also for the, all the folks that are shooting in the outlaw series. You know, all the three gun matches that are you know dominating the landscape across the country. Something that you could take and add ammo to, and and be ready to rock and roll. So we, uh, uh, in our signature blue series for the FN Pro team, you know, the upper and lower are a anodized blue. Um, <clears throat> starting at the back, we went with the, uh, you know, the Mo SL stock. Um, you know, you never know what these uh, these matches are going to throw at you. So I can tell you, I, I've been suspended in chairs and hung upside down and shot around things and under stuff, and and I've probably fired rounds in competition with a you know a stock in every position imaginable. And uh, you know, for the folks that are like, well, I just want to shoot a fixed stock. Well, you're not always standing straight up. And um, uh, so we started with that that Mo SL stock. Continue with a mag pull grip on there. The the Mo Mo grip. You know, get your hand back away from the trigger, um, and, and let you put you you know your your hand in the right position. Get your trigger finger on that trigger in the right spot. Speaking of the trigger, I mean, we put a Timney trigger in there. You know, if you're going to build the match rifle, it has to have a sweet trigger. And the uh, you know the Timney's got a three and a half pound. It's super crisp, super fast. So when we're hammering targets up close, you can really get the get the job done with the Timney. And the same thing for making shots at distance. You know, you've got to hit little plates at three or four hundred yards. The uh, clean, crisp trigger makes the difference. You know, the rifle's got to be accurate, but if you're uh, if you're dragging a, a heck of a trigger, then you know it, it just makes it that much harder to hit targets at distance. So <clears throat> that's a nice feature to have right off the bat. Um, we went ahead and put a 18-inch cold hammer forge and chrome line barrel on there. Um, you know, we guarantee these rifles to be to shoot a minute, but uh, they're shooting way, way, way better than that. Um, so, which is is fantastic out of an AR-15 platform, especially you know one from uh, you know one right out of the factory, knowing that it is it's going to shoot. Uh, you know, be a tack driver. It's got an 18-inch barrel on it. Um, full rifle length gas system. So having the, the full rifle gas system on there helps that thing shoot a lot smoother. Um, it's got a heavier buffer in there so that it, it balances it out. Um, and a surefire uh, um, the probe comp at the end of it. 
I mean, when you're firing this thing, you can just sit there and hold it, put a target out 100 yards, hold the rifle out, rip two rounds, and and know that they're in that target, and and, and just keep on moving. So there, there's little things like that 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 you know we sat and went over, you know, over and over and over again. I mean, all the way down to the thickness of the barrel, um, as far as it is a, it's got just a heavy enough contour that when you pick it up, you're like, hey, this has got some heft out here. So when you're swinging it to a target, you know, you get there and you settle on it, you know, faster. When you're, you know, ripping doubles on targets or shooting a plate rack at 100 yards or, you know, making multiple shots at, at distance, especially in a high magnification, if your gun is, is, you know, lightweight on the barrel and lightweight out there, under recoil, now, I know 5.56 five, doesn't have a lot of recoil, but if you've got a lot of magnification and you're shooting little targets, you know, it, it, j even that much, you know, moves you around. If you jar that sight picture, it takes a second. Uh, it takes probably, you know, a tenth of a second to mm. reacquire and, and readjust. And when you do that, you know, 35 times, it makes a difference. You know, it really, it really adds up. So having just enough weight on the barrel to work with that surefire comp, the rifle length gas system, the heavier buffer, it shoots super smooth. Um, Tell so me, those, uh, all those things. Wh why did you guys go with the one and eight twist when what we tend to see out of uh, most of your rifles in this category are one and seven twist? Um, <clears throat> taking a look at all the the ammunition we're firing in match matches, you know, running whether they're 69 grain or 75 grain or some of the, you know 77 grain um, projectiles, but also being able to stabilize, you know, the the <clears throat> the lighter uh, lighter projectiles, the one and eight just seem to be a great um, a g great compromise in there, you know, and and we did plenty of testing and and like I said, we've been running it. And it just uh, gave us everything we needed on both ends of the spectrum. Now, you you stuck with a standard 5.56 five, chamber? We did. Um, you know, there, there's a, uh, a couple ways to skin that cat with 223 chambers and wild chambers and stretching this and a modification of that. And, <coughs> excuse me, with the 5.56 five, chamber, it gave us all the reliability we wanted, um, which is of the utmost performance and competition. I mean, I can tell you, um, especially on the, the, the pro series, you know, when you're drag racing and it's a 30 second run, you know, I'll take, you know, a theoretical, Hey, my chamber's not as accurate to my gun works every time. Right. You know, that, yeah. that's, that's what really, what really matters. And at the end of the day, we said, all right, let's take our battle proven, you know, chambering and our barrel and see what kind of accuracy we get. And when we throw it down in there and we take the first 40 rifles off the run and they're averaging under three quarters of a minute, we're like, hey, <laughs> we're good to go with that. I don't need to cut this chamber any tighter to try and get to, you know, what, what are we really trying to get to? You know, a half a minute? I mean, come on. <laughs> so we were exceptionally happy with the accuracy of these rifles and having that that 556 five, chamber you know allows <clears throat> you to shoot you know any of the ammunition you find and it gives you more room for mar or margin for error and you know increases your your reliability so it it looks like you guys chose a nickel boron coating for the bolt assembly mm -hmm. is, is that the entire uh, bolt carrier group everything is nickel boron coated Yes. Um, yeah, your whole bolt carrier is. Um, <clears throat> you know, there's so many fancy uh, and, and great coatings out there that 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 you know. I'm not one of the engineers to tell you all the 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 increased lubricity and coefficient of friction and, and it's slick. <laughs> it, it keeps it keeps carbon from sticking on it and it keeps running longer and longer because uh, you know when you're out on on the circuit, sometimes you don't get to clean things as often as you wanted and. Uh, and it also looks pretty damn good. No, I mean, <laughs> yeah, I mean, no doubt about that. And the, <laughs> blue, the signature blue is amazing. Now, is that is that anodized inside the receivers? The same blue? Yeah. <laughs> and see, I would think that that would be the neat thing because, to tell you the truth, I would rather see a blue. Um, uh, innards on a receiver and then be able to tell exactly which parts are dirty? 
Yeah. Because you know I'm convinced that every time I you know scrub down a receiver, I'm just missing over the black part that's the dirt and scrubbing the black part <laughs> that's clean already, and that's why I can go over it with a patch a week later and still find plenty more dirt. You know that, that I think that is an excellent point. Um, I had I haven't cleaned this one yet. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but when I finally get around to it, I, I think I will rejoice in, in in that knowledge that you've just imparted. That uh, yeah, you can wipe it and go, hey, it's clean, it's blue. <laughs> now I did notice that the uh, degree of uh, familiarity you have uh, with the uh, FN competition seems to be in excess of um, some of the other rifles. That tells me that you've used this one a whole lot more in your just kind of day-to-day -day shooting. Uh, is that the case? Is this like your new de facto uh, uh, when you go to the range you take this one with you and you put your time in on it? Yes. Um, I, I haven't got all the trigger time on this that, that I uh, wanted but <coughs> I will tell you I mean uh, um, I love this rifle, and I got to got to. I was fortunate enough to be able to have a lot of input and and speak with our product team, you know, at length about it. So, um, you know, when you really get into the process and, and get to participate in, you know, uh, um, giving your opinion on some of these rifles with the whole team and, and following it from start to finish and, and seeing it come to fruition, and then, you know, taking it out there and, and shooting it, it it's. It leaves an impression on you, so you remember those things. <laughs> well, do you think the the competing um, and then being tied into the the development of product uh, the way you are, uh, does that give you like a closer connection to any part of the line, like this part of the line, than any other, or do you think you get to share that, you know? depth and breadth of knowledge across all of the products that you uh, have a hand with? <laughs> um, I mean, there, there, there's definitely a, a special spot in my heart for the, the competition uh, specific parts, but um, you know, it, it's, it's really fortunate that we have a, a you know, a, a, sm a small team of us that work on the products that are guys that like to shoot. You know, and you know, we we have we have the engineers, and we have the designers, and we have the product team, and you know, these guys go shooting, and you know, it's not a bunch of uh, 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 folks sitting around a table trying to you know dream up what we think other people would like. You know, we get to argue about well, I like this more than than that, and well, no, I like this more than that. And all right, well, let's get the guy with the uh, the calculator and the graph paper over there to tell us which is better, and uh, and you know through that process come out with some really neat um, some really neat things, and hopefully that are are well thought out. I mean, um, like I said, there's there's lots of things on the competition gun that. Uh, you know, we, we spend a, a great length not just, so, hey, what barrel do you want in? Ah, whatever, throw that one in there. It's, you know, no, we want this length gas system, and I want more weight out here, um, you know, for these specific reasons, not just, you know, why don't you grab me a number six and uh, supersize the uh, compensator, and we'll call it a day. You know, it, it, it's, <laughs> it, it, it's at least a you know, a very in-depth process for some of these products. And that, that follows along with the, you know, the tactical carbine and the DMR and so forth. There's very specific reasons that we got to talk about last time that that, that barrel has a significantly lighter barrel under there. Right. I'm less concerned with trying to hit four inch targets repeatedly and shaving, you know, uh, tenths of a second off than I am somebody carrying that rifle for 20 miles and, and, you know, them paying the price of having a, a heavier barrel on the competition to where, yes, do they need to make shots? Yes, they do. Do they need to be accurate? Yes, they will be accurate. But they also are significantly less fatigued and, and so forth, and it's easier to fire offhand, and it's easier to do this, and it's easier to do that. So we try and take the same approach, not just at the competition firearms, but to the ones with a, a more tactical application to them. Um, we go through the same process. Well, so when it comes down to kind of the, the avenues of delivery for for these lines, uh, I'll tell you that when we first talked and uh, uh, we spoke about you know where you were coming out, um, 
I think it took Cabela's probably 11 months to have one of your rifles on the shelf because they were clearing out of their old deals, lining up their new deals, and so it was far easier to get one of your rifles on Gun Broker than it was to go to a big box. But now, of course, mm -hmm. they're at the big box, and so that's changed. How are people going to find your military collector? How are they going to find an $8,000 249? Well, well, right now it is a... Uh... It is a significant back order for those. <laughs> um, actually, for, for, for that entire line, we are um, right now we're completely sold out of, uh, of the military collector series. Um, we've got more, you know, more being built and more going out. <coughs> Pardon me, but uh, you know, I, I I I hate to say you're not you're not going to go find it on a shelf anywhere right now. Um, and it's something that we're doing our best. Like I said, the, we've been focusing, you know, at the top of the Hold on one second. Um, we've been focusing this year on, you know, unprecedented demand, not only because of, of what's going on in the market right now, but just some of these products are, are going over very, very, very well. And, you know, demand for them is is significantly greater than, you know, than we expected or hoped or, or, or what have you. So what are you, seeing, what are you seeing in the market right now with um – just what buying patterns seem to be. Do you believe, do you think it'll fall off as we hit the summertime, or do you think it, we're just going to maintain a steady climb up until whatever happens in the political world? You know, I, I think we will we will maintain here, um, especially with how how hot and heated this year is. Uh, summer's always a, a drop off, you know, in the industry. Um, <clears throat> I, I don't necessarily see it being as significant or as sharp this year. Um, and and consumers are being very savvy as far as, you know, there's no political panic. Um, in, in years past, uh, there's been, you know, I'll, I'll take anything that, uh, you know, ammunition goes in the bottom, bullets go out the front, yeah, you know, give me two of those and, and, and let's go. Um, you know, the quality products are moving and they're moving at a good rate. People aren't just, you know, uh, pushing the cart down the aisle and, and, and shoving whatever goes into it. They're, they're being very selective, um, and we're seeing, you know, the quality products moving at a good rate, and the stuff that, uh, you know, isn't as popular is, is still sitting there. So there's no, there's no hysteria, per se. Mm -hmm. I think it's just people are more inclined to go ahead and, wait for it, pull the trigger on their next purchase <laughs> <laughs> sooner rather than later. Well, in terms of the uh, the competition, um, is that finding its way into um, conventional retailers' hands or is there more of a specialty um, distribution side to it because it appeals to the competitor? Um, <coughs> It, it is it is finding its way into the traditional retailers. I mean, I don't I don't expect you to see it in the in the big box store. Um, you know, it, it may it may happen, but you know, to be honest, we haven't even uh, approached them with you know some of the these items that are a, a higher dollar, higher price point um, gun because we do have. Um, you know, it's a great problem. I can't make enough of them right now. Right. So. You know, when you go into the, the the big box retailers, the available for you to deliver is, is something that is is very important to them. So it is hot and it is new, and people do want to purchase them. But um, uh, you know, if I can't keep a steady supply in their hands, they're not going to be happy with me. So you're you're going to see this in your you know traditional retailers. Well, I have to tell you that we're really excited to get a chance to talk to you about these new additions to the to the lineup. Is there anything else out there that, that you think you want to share with the listeners, or have we kind of drained you of all the information at the waterboarding end? There, there, there's actually one, uh, as we're talking about the competition, there's one iteration of that that uh, you'll be, you know, uh, the listeners should be aware of, and that's something that you're going to find in some of your, your higher-end retailers. Um, we went ahead and put together 200 of a... Um, special run of the competition guns and those are coming right from the factory with a loophole VX6 1 to 6 um, mm. 
you know, FN marked scope. It's something that uh, we worked with uh, Loophold on. It's got a special reticle in there. Um, and it, it, it is a scope that is at a great price point. It's, it's, it's rolled into the you know, into the gun. It comes as one packet with a loophole mount and the scope and uh, some Magpul, uh, <coughs> extra Magpul magazines, you know, Terran tactical base pads, uh, Magpul furniture. They, uh, you know, it's an M-lock rail on there, so it's got some of the, uh, the, the, the grip pads to, to lock into there. It is, it is truly a gun that you can purchase and then, you know, add ammunition and go. Wow. Um, you know, it's really neat, and and it's set up for the reticle that we worked on with Loophold. It is set up for um, either 5.56 or 7.62, and then the most popular grain weights. Um, you know, it's a 200 yard zero. It's got a BDC in there for for three gun. You know, there's a 300 line with five mile an hour wind on it, a 400 line, 400 yard line with five mile an hour wind on it, a 500 yard line with five mile an hour wind on it. Not overly complicated, but for what we're doing, you know, it's got a green fire dot. In the Pro Series, we shoot red targets. So having a red dot on a red target, you know, <laughs> isn't exactly conducive to speed. So we went ahead and put the green fire dot in there. And for all these Outlaw Series, it's a one to six power. You get everything you need for shooting those plates out at, at uh, you know, 400 yards. Dial it all the way back to one, turn your dot on. You can hammer stuff up close. And like I said, with a 200 yard zero, you know, from from muzzle contact to 250, put put the reticle on it, and, and you'll you'll smack the trigger, or smack the target, and then uh, you know for the plates out at distance, you've got the the you know the drops that you need to hit those targets, and uh, very effective. Um, and, and with the um, you know the the math and the calculations we did on it, you know if you're running 62s or 69s or 77s. You know, when you're shooting a 10-inch circle at, at 300 yards, you know, your bullet may be an inch higher or an inch lower or two inches higher or lower than the far end of the spectrum. You're shooting a 10-inch circle. You yeah. know, it, it, if if your goal is to shoot three gun, it is a fantastic setup, reticle, and scope to you know complete the course of fire uh, quickly and effectively. If you want to be absolutely precise and you know shoot paper at 400 yards you know that's not the same setup so we we, we built it to to do exactly what you know you need for three gun so it is a great package they're going to be very limited we did a, a run of only a couple hundred of them and you should see those start hitting the market here um probably in the next month or so so if the listeners were going to search out for one they would call it a that's the FN-15 competition loophole. Okay. FN-15 competition loophole. Yeah. All right. Well, I know that JD's going to start looking for one. He always buys stuff right out there. <laughs> we, we haven't shipped one out yet. They're, they're, they're all sitting there waiting. Um, so we're, we're going to get those things out, like I said, in the next month or so. They're all uh, <laughs> all sitting, waiting, ready to go. Well, that's kind of awesome. Mark, thank you for coming on. Thank you for sharing. And, you know, we've always enjoyed talking to FN. And you guys are the gold standard of what it is to make an M16, an M4, and right now uh, an AR-15. Thank you. It's my pleasure. I, I had a, a heck of a lot of fun. And it's a great time speaking with you guys. So, you know, I, anytime, uh, <laughs> more than happy to speak. Well, absolutely. Well, listen, uh, J.D., why don't you read us out and we'll post the show then. All right. Uh, once again, April 1st, we'll be doing that New Frontier 9mm carbine giveaway. Look for the links on that. If you have any questions or comments, you can send them to ar15.podcast at gmail.com. That's ar15.podcast at gmail.com. Also, subscribe and listen to the AR-15 podcast for free in iTunes or on Stitcher. Uh, leave a review and the show can be placed higher in searches and up for listeners looking for AR-15 content. Share your pictures with us on Instagram at AR-15 Podcast and tag your pictures with that same hashtag. Uh, you can also follow us on Facebook, facebook.com backslash AR-15 Podcast. Check out the other great podcasts on the Firearms Radio Network. And don't forget to use the Brownells affiliate link for all your AR-15 parts needs at AR-15 Podcast. 
And with that, that puts a wrap on episode 163. All right, everybody. Have a great week. We will talk to you soon. This has been a production of the Firearms Radio Network. You can find more information at firearmsradio.tv.